Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 267th episode of Real Hawk Talk. I am Brian Nemhauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger. And we have a fun show tonight. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of some ups and some downs. There's just a little bit of melancholy going on uh, through Seahawks uh, Twitter tonight, and we'll go through all the reasons. But there's also some good news, and we'll cover that as well. It's, it's a mixed bag. And has all sorts of implications, and I'm not sure we'll figure it all out tonight, but we're going to do our best to try. Uh, with me tonight are uh, Dana O'Gorman at Dana OG on Twitter. Dana, good to see you again. How are you? I'm good. I'm sad and happy at the same time after today's news. So yes, it's kind of yeah. a weird day, right? Oh, it is. It yeah. is. And then as a Mariners fan, there's other feelings going on. So oh, there, there, there's a lot. I know that that doesn't register for either of you, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a eventful, eventful right. end of the summer for sure. Uh, also with us after a brief hiatus, Jeff Simmons at real Jeff Simmons. Dude, good to see you. We, I was talking to a Canadian on my car ride back from Eugene. I was helping my oldest unpack his uh, college um, apartment um, as he's moving out. And I decided to do a Twitter space because it was just absolute crap traffic on I-5. And one of the guys, I talked to a guy from Lisbon, Portugal, and then I talked to a guy from North Carolina, and then I talked to a guy from up your way. And his internet seemed pretty good, so uh, you guys have figured that out. Yeah, so I switched providers a couple of years ago, and since then, there hasn't been any knock on wood issues in that oh. in that sense. I have many other issues, but unbelievable. No, no. <laughs> no. No, it was a minor blip. It was a minor okay. blip. You're good. So funny, funny story. I was at a wedding the other night, Sunday night, and I'm coming home in the Uber, and I'm pretty out of it at this point. This is like one in the morning. I had way too much to drink that night. And some for some reason, your Twitter space popped up on my phone. And I don't realize how – like it must have been running or something because maybe it was a different time in your time. And I hit the button on my phone – and my fiance turns to me. He's like, "Why are you listening to a Seahawks podcast in the middle of the Uber?" And I'm like, "What are you talking about? Like, I, I couldn't even like keep my eyes open." And I look at my phone, and your Twitter space is blasting in the Uber. I had no idea he was even playing. And so, I, I, my I Uber feel got to listen to your uh, your space show for a bit. Yeah, I, I'm touched that you you uh, you listened to that that ramble. It was it was actually kind of fun. It's always it's it's cool. I think we don't we don't actually spend people don't know this. Like good podcast folks are spending time looking at their stats and where where they have their listeners and the demographics and the countries and all this kind of stuff. We don't do that. But the truth is that it's a, Seahawks are an international team. Uh, they have a really strong following in Europe and in Brazil and like all sorts of places and all, all across the country. And so it's always a kind of a cool reminder to talk to some folks from all over. And, and we always appreciate when people reach out, let us know where they've heard about us and that they're listening. So, and by the way, part of the how, way that you help grow the community, um, give the show a like subscribe and go over to patreon.com slash hawkblogger and join up and you can be part of the Slack community as well, which is always awesome. And we'll get to some patron questions later today. Also, you should know that patrons have been getting tickets to games. So we gave away preseason tickets again this year. As we have tickets available during the season, a lot of people reach out to me or to others like, hey, we've got some tickets to give away or to sell at face value. Uh, so, yeah, being a part of the patron community is a really good deal and also helps support great causes. So patreon.com slash hot All right. So let's begin. Let's begin. I think all of us had a moment today when the news broke that Jackson Smith and Jigba was having surgery on a broken wrist with no previous, like no sign of this, no conversation about it during the game, no post-game conversation. 
no nothing. No, this was came out of the blue. And you guys tell me if you had a different experience, but I had no idea. This is completely blindsided. And since the news came out early this morning, earlier this morning, I should say, uh, we got news from Pete that it's a quote slight fracture and that they're hoping it's three to four weeks and that they're hoping that maybe he can be back for the opener. We won't know until the surgery has been done. So we don't know. The only things that we know for sure is that he's having surgery and that he has some sort of fracture and it's on his wrist. That's what we know. Jeff, this was your guy. This was the guy that when he got picked, you were the first person that came to my mind because you were so excited about this guy, the potential. And we thought there was no chance he would come to our team. Tell us how you reacted when you heard the news. Ah, uh, my heart sunk. Um, I went through a lot of stages of grief today. Um, we're a few of us are in a text thread, and I think it was Evan who sent the screenshot of it. And I was in a work meeting. And nowadays with Twitter, you don't know what's real. And I, I thought Evan was just trolling. And once it sunk in, it was real. It just really sucked the life out of me. Uh, just for so many reasons. Any time I've really talked about the Seahawks this year, I've talked about how important my view of them, how important like the offense is and how they have the potential to be that like championship-level offense. And really, if you're looking at their strength of their roster, having those three receivers is the number one thing I was the most excited about. And – if you've watched either the two preseason games or read any training camp reports, he's just fit in like a glove. And he's been, there's been like almost no learning curve. It's pretty, even the play he made that he got hurt of was an unbelievable play. And he's just, I was saying before that they shouldn't even play him in the preseason. So I'm a little annoyed that they did. It seems like a complete waste of time now just to get, I know that I'd much rather have him healthy for the season. I was hoping they'd keep him under bubble wrap. So it's still it sucked the life out of me. That that's a big blow to me. My excitement about the team, my excitement about the ceiling. Uh, I did a lot of research on wrist injuries today, and the opener seems very very optimistic in classic Pete fashion. There's a lot of three to four weeks talk. I looked at the schedule. I, I have a good understanding of where they have a week five bye. I didn't remember that, so that kind of helps a little bit. Some of the games they play early help a little bit, but. 99% of me is devastated. 1% is weirdly excited for Jake Bobo, but that, well, I'll get to that later. But 99, probably 0.5% is just devastated. Uh, JSN has been, like, just watching the game. I watched it. I think we all missed the game weirdly on Saturday live. And when I watched it after, just seeing how smooth and how good he looked. And I was so excited to watch him play. I, I ordered his jersey uh, a couple weeks ago, and I'm worried I cursed him. But – um. Yeah, that that one hurt. It's good. It's only going to be like it seems even worst case scenario. It's only going to be one third of the season he'll miss. So he'll still be there for two thirds of the season. I think at the very worst case scenario, it's not devastating. I don't think it impacts his future ability to do the job. But a wrist injury for a receiver that's always it. Something you got to think about. So it sucks. There's no other way to put it. It just sucks. Dana. I'm sure you agree with that general sentiment. Uh, I, I will say one of the thoughts that came to mind for me was, thank God this didn't happen with him returning a punt. I was, Jeff was talking about like he was frustrated that he was getting reps in the game. I was like more okay with that. I wasn't angry about it, but I understand Jeff's perspective. When they had him returning punts, I was like, what are you doing? Like this guy is too valuable to have returning punts. If Tyler Lockett's too valuable to have returning punts, so is JSN. Have someone else. I don't care if you get five yards return, but don't have him back there. Mm -hmm. uh, what? <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at Evan Hill uh, in our chat here. This is one of the most unfortunate looking members of our community, <laughs> but we, we are happy to support all people from all walks of life. Hey, Evan. Um, how... How are you dealing with this? What was your first reaction? What's what's your second reaction as well? Well, my first reaction was the same as what Jeff's reaction in our group chat was. It was one word and it began with an F. But I will say that, um, 
the minute I'm like, wait, wrist fracture, they're doing surgery, but there didn't seem to be a big hubbub about it. Right. Like it wasn't like, I don't know. I didn't think it was such a big deal. So, so now I listen to Jeff and he's like so sad about it. And I'm like, Oh, a couple of weeks. He's good. Like I, I really, at this point, I don't think that he will probably miss more than the opener and possibly the next one, but he'll be back. It'll be fine. Um, I don't think it impacts the season even to be quite honest with you. Um, I don't think one JSN, you know, game is, you know, missing him is going to affect all that much. Now it sucks that it's the Rams game. Cause you know, we, we always like to beat the vision, but um, I, I'm not so concerned about it now that after Pete said three to four weeks, and Pete is an optimist. We do know that, right? Absolutely. But even if you go four to five, it's really, it's really not so bad. I mean, that's just a couple weeks into the season. So I think it'll be okay. Um, but I was surprised. I went back and watched the play because they're like, it's when he almost scored the touchdown. He didn't see it. He must have just hit the turf just right. And which makes me think it's not like a fracture because there wasn't. I mean, he didn't even like act like he was shaking his wrist or anything when he got up. So anyway, I don't, I don't know. I'm hoping it's just maybe a bone chip or something that they just want to stabilize to make sure it doesn't get worse or something. So I think that's a, that's a well-balanced Dana perspective <laughs> which we come to expect from you. I, I, my reaction was a little bit across both of yours, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I, one I don't focus just on the injury. I focus on what type of the injury, what type of injury for the position played. Mm, and the wrist injury for a receiver gives me some concern. And so I, I do understand like why they would prioritize. It's not like you can put a, a club on his, his, <laughs> his arm and let him play. That's not going to work out. Although he's pretty good at one handed catches, but I don't think that's the, the way to go. And you are bracing yourself quite a bit. You are getting tackled quite a bit coming to the ground. And so I, I have some concern about almost having him come back too soon. Like, I, I, just, I think this guy's really valuable. And I want to make sure that when we get him, we get him. And that we're not doing this up and down kind of thing. Because I want him to be a leg of the stool, so to speak, that you can really lean on. I don't want him to be something that gives when you have to put, when you put too much weight on it, you know, it gives out. Like, I just don't think we can afford that with him. I think he's that kind of player. I had a reaction that I know Jeff didn't appreciate um, that I'll share here, which is I also have some concerns. Like this guy has been a game wrecker when he's been on the field, but he has missed a lot of games in the last few years. And uh, I think Jeff's response to this was, you know, that was maybe just one injury, the hamstring. Um, but it, it sure lasted a long time <laughs> and it took a while for him to get back to and end of the day, uh, I think just people that miss time tend to be people that miss time. And I don't want that to be the story here for someone as valuable as I think he is. So that was kind of what went through my mind. I think, I don't know anything about the injury. I don't know anything about this, but generally when I know someone's going under the knife, I always think minimum six weeks you know, um, for them to get all the way back. I don't know. So this is not coming from, you know, totally disregard that, but that's what went through my head is, you know, we're probably six weeks. And interestingly from Jess, you know, what you pointed out, that would be after the buy, which there there's going to be this gravitational pull as they get, if they, if it is not week one that he's back and then it's not week two, week three, then it's like, well, do we risk him before week four, you know, that kind of thing. And so we'll see. Hopefully that's not the case. For people that are wondering, if you haven't already remembered, um, our first five games are home against the Rams, at the Lions, uh, home against the Panthers, at the Giants, and then we'd have our week five bye. Yes? Is that, am I, am I getting that mm -hmm. correct? I think that's right. So, you know, the Rams and the Panthers aren't world beaters. Lions and Giants are our NFC teams that we're going to be con competing with for, for playoff spots. So that's kind of where it is. Um, let's move on to the next re related part of this, which is where everybody goes. Uh, folks, the Seahawks receiver room is a little bit in, in disrepair. We were already knowing that D. Eskridge was going to be out the first six games, and we already weren't necessarily counting on him, meaning – to be a good player anyway. Derek Young, also news today, 
is out visiting a surgeon, a doctor, likely expecting to get core surgery. This sounds like it could be a sports hernia kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Those take a while. I would not count on him maybe this season, but we'll see. Uh, we've also had injuries to, uh, was it Kay Johnson? I think had the concussion, but he's come back. Cody Thompson was back. Um, uh, who am I missing? That's out. Matt Landers, I think has been out, but is expected back. He's an undrafted free agent. So I'm curious, what does this mean for you all in terms of who has now an opportunity to step forward and how do you feel about that? Um, Dana, I'll start with you. I mean, it's obvious, right? I mean, there's, there's one answer that everyone's going to say and it's Bobo. I mean, like seriously, that's, he has shown up so much in preseason and I, I, we even talked about it. It's like, well, he, he might not make the 53, but he'll be on practice. I mean, he's done so well. So this is, this is his opportunity to just step right in there, right? Like there, it's going to be super simple. Um, and I think that that's decent. I think, I think what we'll probably see is some of those, you know, three wide receiver sets maybe we'll turn into run plays or whatever it may be, depending on the team. But I think that for Bobo, for sure, I think this is his opportunity because behind a lot of those guys, I don't know how strong of an opportunity he would have had. Jeff, Pete mentioned Bobo again today as loved the way he blocked on a, one of, I think it's Charbonnet's run play. The guy's checking every box in terms of what the coaches care about, uh, it seems like the players, the, the the quarterbacks, like throwing to him. This happens every preseason to some extent that fans get get enamored with some receiver, um, some receiver. So I'm curious for you, how much are you buying into this? How much do you think that Jake Bobo is going to get time? Like you assume he's going to make the roster now. Do you think how much he's going to be a part of the team? Or do you think it goes another way that, that like the tight ends just play more, they go two back sets, they go less three receivers and, and it just doesn't really matter. Uh, I think it's a combination of everything you talked about. My first thought today, just thinking about it was they have, they ran more 12 personnel last year than they've ran a lot. So they had the three tight end group. They're all healthy right now. They have the ability to run DK lock it and those three tight ends, and they were, that was basically the offense they ran last year. They didn't really have a reliable third receiver other than Goodwin, who played like 30% of snaps. Um, I think that's where you can start early in the season, but I think right now Bobo practiced with the ones as the wide receiver three today. I know Cody Thompson's been up and down. I wouldn't be surprised maybe. I know the Seahawks in the past have kind of started with some of their more reliable guys, some of the lower ceiling guys, higher floor guys. Well, the last game when they were like deep in the goal line, and it was Jake Bobo who got them out of there with that double move on the starting corner on the Cowboys. And yeah, you can't help but think of Casey Williams. We've been that's the one offseason or the one training camp guy that absolutely lit it up and didn't make the team or never ended up playing a role. But it just seems like Bobo has like the proficiency in terms of route running, in terms of just how pro ready he looks. He's just such a strange player because he's slow and he's not, doesn't have straight line speed. And so I can't remember who made this comparison. I read it out this week. Someone compared him to Joe Juravicious, like in terms of his playing style. Is that you? I think I, I've made it, but I think also uh, Griff made it. See, Mike's been yeah, it was, I admit it. I obviously, he's, Joe Juravicious was like a reliable veteran receiver when he came to Seattle. But like in terms of like body type and playing style and how they win, they're actually kind of similar. So I think Bobo is the guy who could kind of benefit here. I wouldn't be surprised if it's week one. Again, it's Cody Thompson. We're all like, what the hell's going on? That's the most Seahawks thing to do. But like Eskridge, not only is out, he's, he's not only suspended, he's injured. And Dariq Young, this is a big, he probably would have been the favorite for this job, but he hasn't really practiced all of camp. So it's really probably Kay Johnson, Bobo, or Cody Thompson. And I'm Definitely open that Bobo takes the job. Have you seen the list of wide receivers? Half of them are undrafted free agents. I, I always say, oh, they're looking for their Doug Baldwin again, you know, because when they get all those undrafted free agents. But it's interesting because they've added more. And so they know, I feel like that is a sign that they know they're going to need 
maybe rotational play. They're going to need a lot of depth there because there's maybe not one guy that they've settled on. I think Bobo is probably, like you said, the easiest one, but you know, to look at, but at the same time, it just seems like they just keep adding that list and making it bigger. Like they're looking for something. Uh, well, so let's talk about that for a second, because mm -hmm. first of all, Joe Gervais is one of my favorite underrated Seahawks. Like I, I loved cheering for that guy. I love the way he played, um, reliable, you know, great blocker, tough. Like I just, I love that guy. And so I think that's part of what makes me think about Bobo. And I think he seems like a, a, a do right kind of a receiver. I think that he is the only one that I would be excited and happy to see on the field. I don't want to see Cody Thompson and Kate Johnson. I, I think those guys are just, for a to use a baseball term kind of players like good enough to make a roster maybe but you borderline practice squad not good enough to have much more upside i think jake bobo could be a guy that could grow into a third like a reliable third receiver for a team um and and i think that that's that's cool i think he can do a lot of things well i think there's two other guys that have caught my eye um i know matt landers is someone that a lot of like he had the the flashy touchdown in the first game i think he's pretty raw so i don't, I don't think that he's he didn't really play special teams in college i don't think he's he's a likely candidate to make it here but there's two names i will put out there one's for the for wazoo fans but i also believe in it um Aesop winston jr um is a guy that i think looked really good in his game that he played. He was able to play in the first game. He caught that touchdown. I thought he looked like, to me, a higher quality receiver, um, especially as a slot versus guys like Cody Thompson or Kate Johnson. The other guy that's worth mentioning because he had a really strong last game was Tyshawn Lindsey. Um, and I think that's another guy that flashed and, and is worth at least keeping an eye on. I don't think either of those guys make the roster most likely. But they're worth keeping an eye on now because who knows if there's other injuries or there's other things that happen. Those guys now become part of the conversation and we haven't mentioned their names at all. So I just wanted to bring those two guys up. Were you going to say something, Dana? Yeah, I was just thinking that this might this really affects the practice squad at this point, too, doesn't it? I mean, they're going to keep a little more wide receiver depth on the practice squad in case in case he can't come back for six weeks, you know, in case another one falls. So I think that, you know, as I said, I don't think it's like a huge impact on the season. It is going to impact the way they have to put this team together, you know, and, and for even for long term, they're going to have to change what they're looking at on practice squad just to keep more around. Yeah. Well, and one, one last point on this and we're happy to, if you guys want to spend more time on it, we can, but one other name I will bring up because people Fans often forget about this. Once you get past the third receiver, and it's almost just useful to think about this like three through six, the farther you go down on the depth chart, the more it matters how you are as a special teams player than it does that you are as receiver. So you could be a good receiver, but a bad special teams player and have very little chance to make the roster unless you're a great receiver or have like real potential. Um, so, Another name to at least be aware of is John Hall, who had a hell of a blocked punt in the second game. You better believe that got the coach's attention. That's a great special teams play. And so there could be some kind of upset at the bottom of the receiver room. If there's a guy that the special teams coach feels really excited about, um, that might be a, a factor here as well. All right. That was not the only news. Uh, we already talked about JSN. We talked about Derek Young. The other news, and we're, we're kind of going, you know, sad stuff first. We'll get into the good stuff later. Um, Mike Morris. Mike Morris. Dana, after first starting with Jeff and kind of hearing his, his heartache um, over the guy that he's most excited about being injured, I've got to come to you to talk about Mike Morris because we found out today he had a procedure, quote, a procedure, which means some sort of surgery on his shoulder. It's a pre-existing injury and they don't know when he's going to be back. It doesn't sound like he, we should expect for him to be available for the beginning of the season. How are you doing with that news? That sucks is what it is. Well, it sucks for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, he was, 
kind of down the line already, but he was making progress because he was showing what he could do. And so he was moving up, you know, that depth chart and getting people's attention. And then this comes along and it can completely derail somebody. You know, they just don't have the opportunity to continue to show what they can do. And that breaks my heart for him because I really think that Mike Morris could be a, a, a really good, solid football player. I don't know about great. I don't know about elite, but from what I've seen, really good. And so if it's a pre-existing condition, it makes gives me a little pause because at least they knew about it, right? Let's hope that they knew about it prior. Um, and maybe they're like, it wasn't ever taken care of properly. So let's get it taken care of so that we can then get you rolling going forward. That's my hope. I, that, that's the Pollyanna in me. I'm like, oh, they're going to get it all fixed, bring him back mid-season and he'll be just fine. But it did sound more serious than than maybe I would have liked. Um, but at the same time, it just bothers me because I think he had some really good momentum going and this will just completely derail that at this point. Um, I just hope they they see it through and they don't just bail on him. I think he's too good for that. I think that they, I, I think they'll keep him around. Yeah. They, I mean, Pete was talking yeah. about how he's excited to get him back. Yeah. Before, you know, after the game last week. And now that I'm sure they're pretty bummed about this as well. Yeah. I mean, Jeff, we know the defensive line has been our biggest concern. How big of a blow do you think this is? Um, I wouldn't say it's a huge blow to the defensive line because they're just they're so top heavy. And right now they're so reliant on a few guys, but it just reemphasizes how thin their depth is and how much they're one injury away from just like totally falling apart like a Jenga board. And there's been a lot of chatter in like league insider articles that see, I was looking to add to the D line in terms of like other cuts. And this just emphasized to me, they're going to add, they're going to add after cut down day. They're going to keep adding. Maybe they'll add a vet for week two, but a scarier thing is let's go through the Seahawks draft class right now. Mm. ASN injured for three to four weeks. Witherspoon has been banged up the last few weeks. We'll talk about him in a little bit. He's progressing in a good way, but he's out with a hamstring injury. Charbonnet missed the time earlier in camp. He's back now. That sounded pretty ominous. Mike Morris and Cam Young, both of them are not playing. Olu has been out with an elbow injury after a really good first preseason game. So basically the entire draft class is injured. And... I was thinking the other day, like, this camp is going really smoothly. Like, the two preseason games were way more fun than the last few years. And now, a week later, like, the entire draft class is injured. And it's like, man, these guys just – they can't have a normal training camp. Their first pick is always injured almost every year. I don't know what how they got this luck. But, man, like, from first round to fifth round, that's a lot of guys who are just not on the field right now. It's kind of sad because that's a really big key for them taking a step forward this year. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of the other guys that we'll talk about in a second, but it is, I guess my question for both of you, knowing that, knowing that injuries have been an issue, do you hope to see any of these guys that might be able to play in this rookie specifically play in this last preseason game? Or are you like, no, don't want to see them play. Just get them ready for the regular season, and we'll, we'll figure out what they look like once we get there. Yeah, that's how I am. Um, I think you know all the guys who are going to be playing in the regular season, I would assume you have a pretty clean evaluation on them. I think this game should be about the final pieces on like some of the bubble players at the end of the roster. Have those guys play. Let those guys battle it up for special team snaps. And everyone who's going to play roles in the regular season, and I'm guessing after they lost JSN in a meaningless game, they're going to be extra careful in this game. So for me, let all those guys battle out. Some of those guys you mentioned earlier who had good games, let them fight for jobs. And everyone who's planning on playing against the Rams, keep those guys healthy. Dana, I think, what about you? Yeah, I think that's kind of been the MO the last couple of years, though, if I remember correctly. You know, if you think about that last preseason game, no starters play. Um, even a lot of second level players don't play. Um, so I think that that, um, that will probably be the case. I'm not even sure Drew Locke will play after he got banged up, although they said he was fine, but maybe just 
let our little third stringer, whose last name I can't say, I never remember. Taylor, yes, thank you. Um, you know, let him go in there and have a game, and maybe he can catch on, you know, somewhere or get him ready for practice card, whatever it may be. So I think that I think that that has been kind of what Seattle has done as of late. Anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't have Bobo play if he's really now their third wide receiver. Their problem might hold him back too. Um, but I think that's just kind of logic at this point, because the last thing you need is for Derek Hall to go down or, you know, someone else, you know, who is, who is vital to, to go down. So I think, I, I think that we're going to see a lot of like third and fourth level players on this game, which is good. I mean, you need to see what they can do. I think that's probably right. And it's, it's still unfortunate. I, I personally like the guy that I would like to see the most of is, Cam Young that we haven't seen at all. And because there's a lot riding on that and uh, what he can or cannot do. And they're going to have to project a lot there. And it sounds like he will not play in this game anyway. Um, and we're just going to have to hope that he's good. And I think that, that the trade thing or the picking up a guy, um, all those things become pretty highly likely given the way things are going on that, that defensive line. Um, man, we want we got to help me remember. We got to come back to Mr. Holton Aylers. I also want to come back to Levi Bell because I think there's some really cool stories we didn't really talk about coming out of the last preseason game. Those are two of them in my mind. Bobo is what gets all the attention, but I think the other two deserve more 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 attention um, than they have. Um, but let's just go through really quickly some of the other news, and we'll we'll go through it in a batch. So those are all the people that were. Out. So J JSN out with wrist injury, Mike Morris out with a shoulder injury, Derek Young out with a core injury. Surprise of the day, Jamal Adams is coming off PUP. Will be will come off either tomorrow or Thursday. Uh Olu, Cam Young, and Kenny McIntosh, three of the draft picks that, that Jeff mentioned, are all expected back for the opener. Jordan Brooks was on the field in full team drills today and is expected to play in the opener. And Devin Weatherspoon was out in um, uh, walkthroughs today. And if you follow along with how the team does this, the team has people go through walkthroughs one week and by the next week, they're then back to playing full, which would have him on track to play to start the regular season. It's a lot of good news too. So pick your poison, Dana. You, you lit up when I mentioned Jamal Adams is coming back. Why? I'm so excited. Well, number one for him. I, yeah. I think it's important for him to get back on the field, you know, and I think that, you know, we forget it's been a full year since he played football because it was the opener that he got hurt in, in the first quarter of the opener, right? And so um, it's been a whole year. So I think that that will be good for him. I think it'll be good for the team also. Um you know, he's been great on the sidelines and they talk about his leadership and all that other stuff. But to have a player on the field, I think, makes a difference. But I just I'm excited to have him back. I don't expect him to play still for a while. I'm assuming it'll be at least a couple of weeks. Right? They have, what, four weeks to bring him back? Is that right? Basically, if if they had left him on the PUP, then he couldn't come back before four weeks in the season. Mm -hmm. So the, fact, the only reason you bring him off the PUP is if you expected him to play within the first four weeks of the season. Wait, that's what I meant. Like four weeks is tradition, like yeah. at the most. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So that's exciting. I, I don't know that I expect him to play in the opener, but I, I guess we'll just have to see. He, I follow him on Instagram and the way he's working out, he just looks completely 100% normal. And so that is pretty exciting. But um, so, yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited I had to get Jamal back on the field just because he's a lot of fun to watch. But I was shocked, shocked about Jordan Brooks today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, Jeff, you and I, maybe me the most, but I think you and I have both been on this train of, I'm not even thinking about Jordan Brooks or Jamal Adams. If they play a snap this year, great. If, if you know, let's not count on it. We should think about this defense as not having either one of them. We certainly – we're not thinking that either of them would be available for the first game of the season, let alone the potential that both of them might be. What What's your reaction? Uh, I'm absolutely shocked. I was completely in the camp you just talked about. Brooks got injured 
I think it was January 1st or January yeah. 2nd. And I thought he's a certain – I remember there were people like on our chat were like, oh, why is Brooks starting on Pup? I'm like, I don't even think Brooks is going to be back till week nine or week like 12. And the fact that it's trending that he's going to play in week one, and apparently he's running and he's back to his speed, and it's shocking to me. And Jamal was a guy just – his injury was just pretty grueling and that's a hard, really, really hard injury that's taken down careers before. And again, I was in the same camp. I thought he was sort of a house money guy. If anything you got from him to me would be great. I wasn't factoring him into the defense and all of a sudden their defense, if they can get those two guys on the field, like the linebacker group was a huge problem last year. This inside linebacker group. Uh, we haven't like seen much positive, we haven't seen much negative from Devin Bush and Gaines, and now yeah, that's really negated because he was a big – I know, Brian, you were really, really worried about that. And yep. that group now, Pete was kind of talking about how they're going to use them today. I know people were asking about that. And it seems really interesting how they can use Bobby as like the base mic and, and they can kind of use him as more of a line of scrimmage player and have him attack the line instead of dropping him into coverage because you can have Brooks and Bush do that. And – all of a sudden, their defense outside of the, the, the interior D line, the interior D line is still a massive issue. But if you can get those linebackers and now you can use Jamal, like the rest of the defense looks pretty interesting. And mm-hmm. I know uh, Peter King was at camp, I think it was yesterday, and he suggested people draft the Seahawks defense in fantasy. And I was like, wow. <laughs> what? I were kind of, I was like, t- really taken back by that. And Brock Heward was there today. I think he tweeted this out that, like, they just look fast and violent compared to last year. And there's a lot of interesting things going on on the defense. They're, again, there's that one very, very obvious issue. But now if you can get Brooks and Adams, again, I don't know what to expect and whether they're just being in walkthroughs or when Jamal's actually going to play. But there's a lot of pieces there. And now that Witherspoon's training back, they have some interesting things going on defense. So. It's one thing I'm very curious to watch because there's a lot, especially Brian wrote about it, I thought really well in his article. It's just the outside uh, pass rush group looks really, really interesting. Yeah, it's – I will always try to call attention to when I'm wrong. Um, Unlike, I think, a lot of folks that are creating content and blogging and podcasting because – I love being wrong. It's usually something where I'm learning something or that I tend to be a little bit more, uh, most of the time, I think I'm, I'm probably more pessimistic on certain things. Um, just kind of protect my fragile little heart. And, and I like to be surprised in the good way. And look, I'm thrilled that Jamal Adams and, and Jordan Brooks are looking like they're going to prove me totally wrong, which is great. Caveat there. One thing is getting back on the field. The other thing that step two is actually playing well. Like the, we have to see that not everyone's at their same level once just because they come back. Sometimes it takes a while. And then three is staying on the field. So we're at, we're at stage one of those three things. And I think that's absolutely worth celebrating and not something I expected to happen. So I was wrong about that. I also, to your point, Jeff, I've been very critical of the Devin Bush signing. I thought that that was a miss. I thought there was some better linebacker options that were also pretty affordable that the team didn't pursue or didn't weren't able to land. Uh, you know, you and I have talked, and there might be all sorts of extenuating circumstances for whether those players are really options here. But Devin Bush has not been a good player in in Pittsburgh for the last couple of years, especially last year. And I didn't see a real reason to expect that he'd be better here. But his first two games were good. They were good. And so this isn't a situation where it's like, thank God Jordan Brooks is back because, God, we'd have to play Devin Bush if he wasn't here. This is the best case scenario because they can play both of them. They can rotate. They can take pressure off Brooks. They can go with the guy that's playing the best. They can give Bobby a breather. I think either Bush or Um, Brooks, but most likely Brooks can play Bobby's position. So this puts them in even a better role to potentially have uh, Bobby, you know, not have his weaknesses accentuated. I think that's all really, really cool. I think that's stuff to be really excited about. And the person that we have the least awareness of how he's going to be used in this defense is Jamal Adams. I mean, I think that the fact that 
you know, we talk typically about players being able to play maybe safety and nickel corner is like a flexibility for Jamal. It's safety linebacker and edge. Like he's an edge rusher, like good luck on, on being able to predict how they're going to use him. They're going to be able to bluff and blitz and all sorts of stuff that I think one of the things I don't know about this comes up for both of you, but this team, this defense in particular has more flexibility than and versatility than maybe any defense we've seen, especially on the back end, but now even at the linebacker position and to some extent at edge. And it makes me really put my focus on the defensive coordinators. Like you better use your tools. I don't want to see bland vanilla scheme that everybody knows exactly what's happening at all times. I also don't want to see clumsy oh my God, it's obvious what they're doing. They think they're being clever, but it's very predictable what's happening. They have an opportunity to really disguise their coverages, disguise what, what you know, blitzes they're doing. I want to see an unpredictable defense that has offenses really on their heels and they have the tools to do it. So that's the part that's got me kind of revved up and, and uh, it will only matter if they can stop the run. You know, guys like Miles Adams become more important than we've given him credit for. Guys like, uh, um, oh my gosh, Mario Edwards becomes more important. You know, I, I, that's pretty scary <laughs> to say that, but that's kind of the truth. So uh, I'm excited about that. Um, I was happy to hear about the other, the other guys coming back. I don't think the older news is that big of a deal from my perspective. I think a lot of people... Like, ah, oh, man, I was hoping he was going to be the starter. And I was like, I was too, but I think it was pretty clear he wasn't going to be. Um, so I, I think I think Evan Brown's a starter, even if Olu was healthy. And then um, the Devin Witherspoon piece is the part we've spent the least time on. That's good news. And I want to know for both of you, Mike Jackson got picked on in this last game. We already have some concerns about Mike Jackson and our, like, I think across the, the fan base. Like we're, we like Mike Jackson, but we're like, is he really the guy that we want starting opposite of, of Woolen? What do you think? Not what do you want? What do you think the coaches are going to do week one in a base defense where they only have two corners on the field if, if Weatherspoon's healthy and active? Who's the starter opposite Reek Woolen? Assuming that, you know, Witherspoon's not going to play in this preseason game, so you won't see him there. Dana. Who do you think, who do you predict the coaches will put out there? I think they'll put Witherspoon out there. I, I think picking him in the first round. So on another, the other, one of the other podcasts that I do, um, one of the gals, Lisa, she always says, you get picked in the first round, you start. Like that is her tried and true. If you get picked in the first round, you are a starter. Don't pick a kid in the first round if you're not going to. And I think that that's very true for both of Seattle's picks this year. Um, and I think they want Witherspoon. He brings that excitement. People are excited about him. People aren't excited about Mike Jackson, which is too bad because he does have great moments. He does look really good sometimes, but he does have some questionable things that happen. And you're right. They 100% picked on him the entire game. But so I'm assuming once again, if Witherspoon is healthy, which I don't know that they'll trust that game one, but if he is in... Um, you know, and there he's ready to go, then yeah, they've got, I mean, they have to put Witherspoon out there. We have to see him. We, the fans themselves have not gotten to see him yet. Yes, this is true. Which also means by the way, opposing teams have not have any tape on him either. I absolutely hope Dana's right. I think the timing might work against them. He just hasn't been on the field enough. If I had to guess right now, I say they start the year with Jackson. And if I was ranking the three options, I would probably have Jackson third. I, I am in your camp, Brian. I like Trey Brown a lot. Mm. And Trey Brown's a guy in 2021 when they were having trouble finding outside corners. He's a guy we all looked at that year. It's like this guy's a long-term starter. And his speed is back. You saw the interception. He still had – he's had some issues in some when he's played. But to me, I think he's a better cover corner. He's got better ball skills. Jackson is, I think Jackson's more of like, you, you can trust him. So the coaches might go with him. So my gut would be him just for week one, but we're going up against Cooper cup week one. I want Witherspoon on the field. Um, he's the best slot receiver in the league right now. And I want Witherspoon on him all game and Witherspoon just plays such a ferocious style, but 
It's Trey Brown. I'd be pretty pumped too. Trey Brown's a really fun player. He almost got lost in the shuffle, and he's going to play a lot this year. I feel. Yeah, Mike Jackson is just a guy that. I mean, look, you know that I I was excited about him at the end of the 2021 season when he got signed late, made had a couple of games, and then he ended up getting a chance to become a starter the next year, last year. I'm really excited. I like him. I think he's a good addition. I think he's a, a solid starter. I just think there's a there's a ceiling there that's a little bit lower, and I think his limitations are more easily exposed. Trey Brown, man, that pick was not a was not just a run of the mill pick. Like he he kind of baited the the quarterback into making that throw. It was it was a savvy play, and his break on the ball was swift and fluid. And he's just a fluid athlete. He's a the way he moves at corner is is different than the way Mike Jackson moves at corner. They're very different body types. Mike Jackson is two seventeen or something. Like, he's a big dude um, for corner, and so I like Trey there. I think I, I said this on the Twitter space. I did my gut instinct is they'll put Jackson out there because the coaches don't seem to be they don't seem to be as much of a risk taker there. They'll want to have seen more. But there's, I think there's a better chance that Witherspoon starts out there than we're probably giving it credit for. I think that there's a chance that they know what he is and that they've been wanting to get him as many reps as they could inside because they, they know he's going to slide inside in, those, uh, in that formation, in that sub package. And their plan was to start him all along outside anyway. Uh, that's, that's a, I think that's a, I'd give it a 40% chance almost 50 50. I think it's a 40% chance that Witherspoon starts out there. Um, and man, that's certainly what I want to see that like of the, of the choices and look um, on the corner position, when we've talked about depth there from the very beginning, Artie Burns has also played well. I don't think he's going to make the team. I'm wondering what they can get for him. Can they get a seventh round pick for him? You know, like, is that possible to get a conditional sixth round pick for him? But like this guy, this guy's played well um, and is a, is a veteran. So I think there's been some question about whether Mike Jackson would be traded. I wonder if his, his value was diminished by the way he played in that Dallas game, but it feels like there could be reason to make a move from a position of strength and Jeff and Dana, two positions of strength, corner and edge. I'm going to ask you this, and I want, like, I'm, this is going to be out of left field for you. Would you trade one of our edge players? Think back, think back to the Jadavian Clowney trade and Jacob Martin, you know, being a person that we had to give up in order to get Clowney. I know how much Dana is, is reveling in that memory. We have more depth there, and we have more prudent, like, prudent talent. So, would you would you be interested if if there is a more straight up deal? I'm not saying this is what it would be, but if there's a straight up deal that required you to trade a Derek Hall, a Boye Mafe, a uh, um, oh, who's the one I'm forgetting? Daryl Taylor. Daryl Taylor. Thank you. Daryl Taylor for someone like DeForest Buckner. Oh, you're giving up a edge rusher to get someone that can fit your interior defensive line. Do you do it? I would in a heartbeat. I would. I, I think it's we've, it's the, one of the hardest positions to fill in the entire league, just in terms of like high quality. There's, the Seahawks have done a pretty good job historically finding rotational defensive linemen on the cheap. And just finding good veteran players. They're taking a different approach here with spending on a lot on um, Draymond Jones. And Jared Reed's looked all right so far, but it's the preseason. Um, yeah, I would do that in a heartbeat. I think that just kind of rounds out the defense. And if you can get someone like DeForest Buckner, pair him with Draymond Jones and create another position of strength there. I think you have enough depth at edge rusher. Levi Bell, I know you're probably going to talk about him. Tyreek Smith, those guys are your fourth pass rusher. That doesn't kill you. And you have the, the development of Mafe and 
Hall looks like physically, he looks up to the task. I don't know what kind of speed rush he has, mm -hmm. but I think if you had the opportunity to go get one of those guys, I think that upgrades you a lot more than just keeping those four edge rushers. Dana, you had a different reaction. Uh, Taylor is the only one I would give up at this point, to be honest with you, just because, I mean, we've been bitching about edge rushers for so long and now we finally have a handful. And we're like, let's get rid of them. Why the hell not? So, you know, I think Taylor, I think definitely would. I, I think we've seen what he can do. And so I, I don't know that he's going to make another jump or anything. So Taylor, I would be fine with Taylor and I don't know whatever round pick it would take to get to force Buckner. But here's the thing. I think that that's a bit of a pipe dream. Jim is has lost his ever love in mind with Jonathan Taylor. So I don't know that he's going to turn around and piss that fan base off even more, but um, at the same time, he's kind of nutty. So maybe, maybe he'll do it. Um, but I think the only one I'd be really comfortable with, especially, and I know you guys don't think the same about Mafe is, is a lot like the camp talk. And you, even I do that. He's, you know, really, really gotten better this year. Um, but I would hold, I would hold on to him at this point, but Taylor, I would do it. Yeah. It's, I love this because it's really the eye of the beholder here. So Taylor, as folks remember, uh, had nine and a half sacks last year. They might not remember. He has the second most sacks. I believe it's the second most sacks in a Seahawks players first 32 games or whatever mm -hmm. it is that he's played. He didn't play his rookie year. Um, he's been very productive as a pass rusher from a sack perspective. Um, and he is a restricted free agent. So they have him for another year uh, after that. He is, he is, I think, the best edge pass rusher that they've got on this roster. And I think has the highest potential to be a Pro Bowl level pass rush, edge pass rusher, um, outside of obviously Uchenna. Uchenna, I don't think about as an, as an edge rusher. I mm -hmm. think obviously he plays that role, but I don't think that's his greatest strength. I think he's an all around good player who can rush the passer. Yeah. I think Daryl Taylor is a pass, pass rusher. Like, I think but that's, that's his value, right? Is the yes. fact that he has those stats. And so someone might actually do it for him. I have a feeling that if he tried to hand over Moff, Moffay to somebody and they're going to want a higher round pick. And I, I think that it's like, give Taylor, let Moffay develop. And then, you know, you wouldn't have as much, you know, additional. I think that's a, that's a really mm -hmm. solid uh, logical point of view. And, and I don't think that's necessarily wrong. I think people are just very quick to give up on Taylor because I think there's a, a, a miss, uh, an undervaluing of him in, in the fan base. They, they think he's hurt all the time. I, I see that all the time. Yeah. It's like, yeah, he missed a season. Oh, again. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that, that Mafe has improved a lot. There's no doubt. And I think we're going to reap the rewards of that. But I think people have to realize he's improved from being a, you know, average to below average rotational mm -hmm. edge player to being a above average rotational edge player to maybe being like scratching the surface of being a starting quality edge mm -hmm. player. I'm not sure he's for sure shown to me that he's someone that's got like significant ceiling where this guy could be a pro bowler down the line. I, I don't mm -hmm. think I see that. I think some fans are thinking of that. I, I don't mm -hmm. see that yet. And I think that um, Derek Hall has to me already flashed a higher potential ceiling than Mafe. So, I mean, he's, he's one I wouldn't want to give up. And I, that's another one I was wrong about. Hopefully we'll see as we get into the games, but Jeff, I mean, one, I'm curious your thoughts on Mafe because we've talked about that a little bit, but two, I, I want to hear your perspective on Levi Bell and Tyreek Smith, because I think this is important to this conversation I've been I've been pretty bold in my point of view on Levi Bell. Um, I've been less bullish on Tyreek Smith, but I think he had a pretty strong game. Are these guys that you'd feel any he like hesitation or concern if they don't make the roster? Like, is that going to give you any agita? No, just because they're so deep at that spot, mm -hmm. they have such a position of strength. Most teams don't have four rotational edge rushers that they can rely on, and they're all basically all other than Nuosa are on rookie contracts. That is a really rare position group. And you saw for years what this team was doing at edge rusher. And we saw a couple of years ago, they were picking Benson Mayo and trying to tell us he was the next uh, Chris Clemens and things like that. So the fact that they had, they keep finding guys and like, honestly, Levi Bell and me and you were doing that first broadcast with like a name. I had no idea who he was. We were kind of laughing him off and he's flashed in both games and, Again, if he didn't make the roster, it wouldn't crush me just because of how strong 
depth of the team is. You'd obviously love to slide him in, but that's the whole thing where if he's your fourth pass rusher, if the team believes he can play with the ones or play with the twos, it allows you to have the opportunity to make a move, kind of move some things around. And that's the reason you have positions of strength, why you have in numbers. It seems like the Seahawks do want to use these guys as chess pieces. So I see them wanting to have four guys that can play to keep them fresh, to keep them. We don't know what kind of pass rusher Hall is in terms of like against first team left tackles. Mm-hmm. That would be very different. <laughs> There's always a huge learning curve for edge rushers relative to the preseason. If you remember Frank Clark's rookie year, if you remember like Rasheem Green's preseason, he was tossing guys around. The game started and he was invisible. So you always have to be a little skeptical when you see that in the preseason. Remember Nick Reed? Yep. He had like the greatest preseason you've ever seen from the Seahawks. And but so I'm not at the point where I'd like be worried if they cut them, but if internally they grade them as 53 kind of players, I think and Tariq Smith is a guy that they they really liked. He was a really highly renowned prospect that got injured at Ohio State. And they said he's finally starting to get his legs back. So he's not just some sort of high effort player. He was a highly regarded prospect that one of the best development schools in the country. And before he got hurt, that he kind of was a bust at college. And Seahawks took a chance on him as a six round pick last year. And he's a guy they might really, really like internally. So they have a lot of options there. And it's just it's, – it's nice to see. I, I spent, like, the first four years of the show just criticizing how they got a new pass rusher every year. Sort of what they're doing with the defensive line right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I I will – I made the same – I brought up the same person in Nick Reed when other folks have asked about the, the Levi Bell thing. And the piece that I'll – a couple things I'll throw out here with Levi Bell. So the other person that – flashed that year as an undrafted free agent for the Seahawks was a guy named Michael Bennett who got cut and ended up going to Tampa Bay. And I think, um, you know, that was a huge regret for the team. They were very fortunate to get him back eventually, but that was a major miss and he flashed there and he flashed not just productivity, but he flashed traits that looked like they were projectable traits to being a pass rusher. Nick Reed never did. Nick Reed was a high effort, high motor guy with, without the physical traits to accompany that. And so his ceiling was always pretty low. Um, I think that there's something going on here with Levi Bell. I think that there's more to it than a lot of folks give it credit for. I think this guy Jeff is absolutely right. That first game, I was making jokes at his expense. I'm like, who the hell is Levi Bell? And like, why is he on the field? And this is clearly like the, an indication of the depth this team has. And it's going to be, the guy has made plays against the run. He's made plays against as the pass, as a pass rusher. He's actually made some decent plays in coverage. He also did something that I think maybe flew under the radar. He had a snap at fullback in this game. Who plays fullback for the Seahawks? Nick Ballore. Who has been injured all of camp? Nick Ballore. Who's one of the oldest players on the roster? Nick Ballore. Who, who might be impacted by their natural position having a lot of depth because there's now a bunch of inside linebackers. Jordan Brooks is back. Devin Bush is there. Um, Bobby Wagner's here. Do you need Nick Ballore as a backup Inside linebacker? No. I think there's a chance that the team's looking to see if Levi Bell could be someone who could fit as he's, – he's also made plays on special team – if this is a guy that could kind of take that spot on the roster. Now, there's reasons to say that's crazy because Nick Ballor was unfortunately signed to a contract that is prohibitive. He has $2.3 million guaranteed money. The team would just eat that without getting a snap of it, um, which it seems – Unlikely. So I'll call that out. But I think that there's not a lot of other reasons for them to be trying Levi Bell at fullback other than that. They're trying to figure out if they can find a spot on the roster for this guy. And I'll put, I'll put my, you know, my two cents out there. I think there's something to this guy. I think there's, there's something interesting there. I am more interested by what he's flashed than what Tyreek Smith has flashed against similar competition. So if, it, if it's to the two of them, I would be more interested in Bell than I would be in, in Smith. But both of them, it's a good problem to have. So 
I think that's that's just one thing I, I I'm curious about with Bell. I would be at this point. I don't know if they could get him to the practice squad. And so I think if you cut Levi Bell, I think you're losing Levi Bell. And I don't like losing undrafted free agent contract quality edge rushers. I think that's a, almost always a roster mistake, and I'd want to see them find a way to not have that be the problem. I'd like to see them maybe use some of that depth to get to fill some of their other holes. So that's where I'm at. I don't, I, you know, if you could trade Levi Bell for someone of value, great. I don't think you can. He's not proven that yet. But I think some of these other guys, I think the conversation's up there for it. Um, I could spend more time on this. I want to spend more time on this, but we, we've got to keep going because we're already an hour in. We haven't even gotten to patron questions. We haven't even gotten to the Richard Sherman interview at Pete Carroll, which I think we need to talk about a little bit. Um, so let's go ahead and switch over to patron questions, um, Dana. And while you're looking them up, I'll just remind people, if you haven't already liked the show, please give the show a like, click subscribe and Go over to patreon.com slash hawkblogger. Get immediate access to the Slack channel where you can ask us questions, but we will try to answer each and every week right here. And also do things like give away games to the tickets, get you tickets at face value where we need to if we can't give them away, all sorts of good stuff, and be part of a really cool community of people that you will enjoy spending time with and maybe make some even some friends with. So Dana, do you have our questions for the week? I do. We don't have very many this week. And to be honest with you, we've talked about some of them, but maybe we can expand a little bit more. So um, that it's LOB Legion of Brazil um, has two questions. First, um, and I will um, direct this to Jeff to start. Um, how concerned should we be about our run defense, especially without a proven nose tackle? I think you should be very concerned with the run defense. Um, they have just – they're thin in terms of frontline talent. They're thin in terms of depth, especially with – they were counting a lot on Morris and Cam Young as depth pieces. In terms of the nose tackle, I think what it looks like they're doing is they're running a different defense than they were last year. And I think that the cue for me was Jaron Reed moving to nose tackle. And even in a little bit of preseason, you can see they're using that position a little differently. They don't have guys trying to win double teams – and where you've seen those guys like Al Woods and those 330-pound guys, even Monet. Last year, a lot of their runs were just they couldn't get off blocks, and then you had guards going against like Cody Barton. Um, this year, Reed is playing nose tackle. He's, a, he's more of a penetrating guy at this point. He's, he's a traditional run stopper with effort, but he's not blowing up double teams and winning off the line. So they're going with a different kind of nose tackle. And, like, if you read Matty Brown, and he's really into, like, scheme, and he can talk about some of the things they're doing different schematically. I'll be honest, a lot of that stuff just goes over my head. Matty's really good at just talking about it, but he's really excited about what they're scheming defensively. So I do think the run defense will be better just purely because they got rid of that old Vic Fangio scheme that they just don't have the pieces to run. And a lot of the teams that ran it last year, other than – some of the best teams in the league. If you saw what happened with Minnesota last year, where they brought in Ed Donatel, they couldn't run the same scheme. So I do think it will be better. I think Bobby helps a lot. I think Jamal helps a lot. I think Witherspoon, if he can tackle, helps the run defense. If you look at like the Josh Jacobs, for example, that run's broken because Jordan Brooks and Josh Jones don't fill their gaps. It's not the defensive line. It's, run defense is a collective thing. And I, but at the end of the day, like you still need those defensive linemen. Look, the best run defensive team the last couple of years when Tampa had Sue and Vita Vita in the middle of their defense. I think the Seahawks should sign Sue if that's if he still wants to play. So I am definitely concerned about their defensive line, but I do think the scheme and some of the other ancillary pieces will help them be a little bit better. But God, if you look at that defensive line group and you're not worried, uh, I don't, I'd like to drink or whatever. I'd like to have what you're having. So <laughs> It's especially with those two injuries right now, there's just not much. Mario Edwards, the guy they plucked off the street for like $3 million. He's an every down player for them right now at five technique. Or, and it's not great. All right. Second question from him. Um, it said, and and we, we kind of already talked about this, Brian, because um, you talked about DeForest Buckner, but maybe someone else, if there's someone else you have in mind, it says, if you were John Snyder for a day and had to make a trade to improve the team, um, it could be involving players, picks, or whatever, what would you do? So maybe other than DeForest Buckner, although I think that's where most of our brains go. Yeah, I mean, 
Is there another defensive player that you would be interested in? Because if Buckner's not available. Uh, I'd have to go back through. Maybe you guys can help jog my memory. I mean, we've talked about Vita Vea, and I don't think from a contract perspective that makes as much mm-hmm. sense um, to, to pull off. But um, I, I'd have to kind of run through. I don't have one mm-hmm. off the top of my head that jumps out. Okay. Um, anything, I think where I'm looking now is where are the teams that have really good defensive line depth and who might be available via cut down that the teams might not be intending to cut, but they're, they've got enough depth that the, the Seahawks could convince them to take one of their players at a position that they need in order to get that. And so I'd have to go through the league roster to kind of figure out which those teams are. Um, like, I doubt Philly is going to be trading us anyone or the 49ers are, but those are two teams with really solid line depth. Um, the, the Dallas Cowboys probably are another team that has pretty solid line depth. Um, maybe the Broncos, but I don't think they're going to be probably going to trade with us anytime soon. So uh, those are kind of the places I'd start. And then, and, you know, the bills, some of those places would come to mind. Um, I don't think Chris, everyone's going to say Chris Jones. He's talking about sitting out, you know, the eight weeks and that whole thing. He wants to be the highest played defensive player in history. I just yeah. don't think that sounds appealing. He and Nick Bosa duking it out. <laughs> yeah, I just I have a hard time uh, seeing that happen. But if mm-hmm. if they could get Chris Jones, do it. I mean, whatever, you know. Let's let's have some fun. But yeah, that's that's kind of where my mind goes. I, I'd have to spend a little bit more time. So sorry for the rambling, kind of lacking of substance response. But that's kind of where I where my mind goes. Um, so Nick S had a question about how worried we should be about the line, um, against the run. Um, I I think we've kind of covered that because the answer is very, so, um, next though is, um, has no clue. Um, this one is for Jeff says, Jeff, what are you seeing specifically that tells you Bobo has NFL potential for practice squad or even the 53? Do you see his performance just as a preseason sensation? What, so what specifically do you like? And other than him being slow as hell, what do you dislike? I think what I see that's projectable is how good his route running is. And I think if you need the double move he put on the starting Dallas corner deep in the end zone is a really, really hard at right to execute, especially at his speed. And if you watch him run that route where they're pinned back and deep and Geno hits him with that perfect pass, that was really, really – Impressive. That's an NFL thing. And we've seen from a lot of these undrafted free agents, there's been a lot of receivers hit coming out of there because so much of their draftable grade comes down to 40 time and 10 yard split and some of the things you can see. But when you can run routes and get open, Bobo has done that at basically at every level. And Chip Kelly went on uh, 710 the day, like a week after the draft, and they were talking about Charbonnet. And I remember this, this was in the back of my mind. He came out and said, the guy you got to watch in camp is Bobo. And I was like, I I think Brian mentioned, I didn't know anything about him. He was just like an interesting kind of looking player. And he's like, this is the kind of guy that just is going to make your team. And he's, but I think what he's, I think his limitation is clearly speed. Uh, He ran a terrible 40 time for a receiver. It was close to five flat. And that is a huge limitation. And, when you see him go against number one corners and number first team corners, that's obviously going to be an issue on some routes, but if you can run or get around and get open, it doesn't matter how fast your 40 time is. It matters if you're precise with your route running, he's got good hands, he's got good size. That's all projectable skills. It's just a matter of can he get open against first team defensive backs? That's the biggest thing with him. But when you watch him run routes in both those preseason games, the double move he pulled in that first game too to score the touchdown that was on Andrew Booth, who was a guy a lot of Seahawks fans were criticizing for not drafting last year they, when they took Kenneth Walker. He was a guy that like, they should have taken this really good corner prospect and clums it. He's now on like, the fifth team of the Vikings for the record, and that pick has not worked out. But that these are guys, he's doing these on good players, and he's burning them. Well, those two routes that he was shown in preseason, those are NFL plays. Those are very projectable plays. Can I build on that real quick? Just, Please. Mm-hmm. I think this is a super fascinating question in general. One, just to illustrate again how slow Bobo is. 
Anthony Bradford, 342 pounds. He ran roughly the same time in the 40 as Jake Bobo. Okay. So that's, we're, we're talking about 342 pounds moving at the same speed. So it's, it's, it's valid to question that, but to, to Jeff's point, I'll bring this back for, for people that are Mariners fans or, you know, I'll, I'll give a name there, but there's other baseball players, junk ball pitchers you can remember. Jamie Moyer pitched for years and his fastball was like 85. I mean, it was like, it was meat in terms of its speed, but he was able to be a quality pitcher for years because of his ability to change speeds. And so even though his changeup was 70, 72 there was like 73 it was super slow but there was a difference between there's enough of a difference between his fastball and his changeup to where hitters couldn't time it up and he was able to be effective and i think bobo is a similar kind of athlete in this way in that it doesn't to jeff's point it doesn't matter what his top end speed is it matters if he can start and start and get in and out of breaks in a way that allows him to get separation from uh, uh, defenders and to make contested catches. Does he have good hands? And he has all of that. So his height helps him do that. His route running helps him do that. And his hands helps him do that. And I don't think this makes him, I think someone in the chat said he's a star. I don't see a star here, but I see like, I see qualities that are projectable to being an effective NFL receiver. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Let's see. Brian, I'll throw this one to you. This is from Eric. It says, what would your top three surprise players to make this team be this year? Um, also, have you identified any potential free agent candidates that might be available and a good fit for the team? I think we'd have to wait for cut downs for that. But what are, what are the top three surprise players you might make this team? Levi Bell, you said. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll say someone like, Ty John Lindsay, like I want to go for honest surprises. I think he or Aesop Winston, but I think more Lindsay because I think Lindsay has the potential to be a returner as well. And he might, with all these injuries at receivers, sneak on the back of that roster to be, you know, essentially a special teams player for them. Like there, there might be a guy that because this is a not a, a thing we spent a lot of time about. It's not that critical, but the Seahawks returners are awful. Mm hmm. Like DJ Dallas is not a good returner. And if they could get somebody who could add to the team at the back end of that receiver spot, and then also that has some receiving potential, that's one that I would call out there as a potential surprise. I would say another one that's a potential surprise for folks that um, is Vi Jones. He's been injured all of like the preseason games, but I think is a guy that they think very highly of. And I think they probably believe has a potential to be a better special teams player and a better linebacker than either Joe Radigan or Ben Burkirvan. And so if he somehow gets back, um, he would be a, a surprise for everybody to see on the roster. So I'm, I'm picking honest surprises. And to the other question, no, I have not spent a lot of time looking at, you know, who might be on other rosters. It's, it's become very hard to do that because you're basically looking at 90 names times 32, mm -hmm. 31. Um, they don't have the, progressive cut down and so it just it's it's hard to hard to really say mm -hmm. i will say i've had more fun watching preseason this year than I, like ever. I mentioned earlier tonight on another podcast did you guys watch the commander's ravens oh, game yeah. so good like it was a really good game and you Why? can hear buck and aikman going you know this has been a lot of fun i've never done preseason before <laughs> they liked it. why is this happening why are these games entertaining this year because they're going all out like these these players these fourth and fifth especially I thought the commanders thought they won the Super Bowl when they beat that streak for the Ravens it was hilarious but those guys were just having a good time and it was it was really enjoyable to watch I I liked it <laughs> there's also been like a slew of like these drafted quarterbacks in like the fourth the fifth round this year mm -hmm. they've all played pretty well in the preseason like I, have. I don't know if you've seen the Raiders guy Aiden O'Connell mm -hmm. yeah awesome and like Brian's guy, DTR, who had killed us when we didn't get drafted him. He's been amazing. And Even so Tanner like, McKee, who I was like Tanner super McKee. down on, has played well for the Eagles. Yeah, Tanner McKee outplayed Marcus Mariota last week, who was the mm -hmm. 
who is their highly paid backup. And there's been a bunch of those kind of even Ailers on the Seahawks who he's, yeah, he's been, been fun, fun to watch. It's been fun. Can we can we talk about him for a second and come back? Yeah. They, well, there was just one more question. It was about Chris yeah, Jones. We already yeah, covered that. that. Are you on that one? Okay. So this one is just um, it's for Max. Um, and he says apologies in advance for persisting on this question. So I don't know if he's asked before, but he wants to know a realistic package that you would offer Veach for Chris Jones. Either one of you. Jeff. <sighs> You'd have to give. It'll be a first. For You'd sure. have to give two firsts. Yeah. When you think about what Jamal was worth when he was like the ascending all pro kind of guy, this is the best player at the most rare position in the league. But the, and then you have to pay him a mazillion. Well, you have to pay him over him and Bosa are going to get over 30 million a year. Mm-hmm. So you got to pay him quarterback money. I just, I can't, I don't think there is a realistic package because I don't want to do that. Jamal Adams trade again. I don't want to give up two first round picks for really for anyone. Um, so it'd have to be two first round picks and they can have, um, they can take DJ Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you probably give him one of the edge players, one of the cornerbacks. I mean, it, potentially depending on the edge player you include or the cornerback, it can maybe go down to one first round pick. Um, I think that's possible. Meh. Yeah. I don't want no, to. thanks. No, <laughs> right. Well, we've been through this so many times. Uh-huh. Percy Harvin, Jimmy, Sheldon Richardson, Clowney. <laughs> like, these hired guns have not worked for this team. Mm-mm. So, but but you do you feel differently about the Buckner possibility? Do you think that the compensation would be different enough that you'd you'd be interested? I do, I do, because I still think he's a different. I think he's a plug and play guy. Um, I think he fills a much bigger need than really any of those guys were, and I think he just really ties the whole thing together. And just him, we've seen him play in this division before, and his contract is very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. All good reasons. Is that it, Dana? Did we hit, did we hit yeah, I'm sorry. I was just looking. Buckner and Chris Jones are the exact same age. I'm like, oh, that makes it tough. Anyway, um, yeah. that is all. That is all for Patreon tonight. Well, thank you for running us through those. Patreon.com slash Hawkblogger. Join now. You get immediate access to the Slack channel and ask us questions as well. All right. Two more topics. I'm going to keep you here a little bit longer because I just, I, I'm so desperate to talk about these things. So one is just a fun thing. I, I put this out on, on Twitter and I want to know how much you guys think I'm absolutely batshit crazy. So, uh, and I know that the answer is yes regardless, but <laughs> let's see the degrees on this one. So, so Holt Nailers. Third string quarterback, also a guy that when he came in in the first game, I was like, oh, God, like, what is going on here? This guy is <laughs> he is a wacko. Like, he just runs around like this is a CFL or something and tosses balls straight into the air and somehow they get caught and whatever. I kind of just laughed it off. But then the second game, he kind of put it together a pretty good all around game, did almost everything well. And I found myself like, there's something about him. I was like, oh, he's like Tim Tebow. He's left-handed. He's wearing 15. I'm like, no, he's not like Tim Tebow. He's a better quarterback. And I think he's, he's a different kind of athlete. But I also had been listening to, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Michael Robinson on the broadcast was like, man, he's got to start sliding. He's, he's, he's running into contact too much. And he slid in this game, and I thought it looked very weird. It was not him. It was not the way this guy was built to play. I think this guy is built to actually create contact and run through contact and to not be a precious wallflower of a quarterback. And so I'm getting to my point. I think this guy is a – his best attribute is as a runner. I think he is an okay passer. And I think that he's tough enough to deal with a lot of contact. Is there is there a chance that he could be like a Taysom Hill for us? Like, and I don't think that <laughs> means that he is going to make the roster and be that from week one. But do you think that they could keep him on the practice squad and look at him as more than a third string quarterback? That he could do other things? 
now you can you started laughing so please let me know jeff you laughed first so i didn't laugh first. at your opinion i laughed at dana's face Dana <laughs> was furious i don't know if that's because of Taysom hill last year or the idea of someone else trying to find Taysom hill but i don't know what dana was so we should get dana on here she looks furious still talking about no it. i'm not furious it's just the Taysom hill experiment doesn't work and we know that and it's 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 a, a spot that you're holding for you know for silly play i don't know it just is not now granted you're gonna say oh it worked against seattle well yeah it sure did but let me just tell you this i, I think that while the idea is fun and it would be enjoyable unless you really thought he could be a quarterback you that's where you have to start that's what he's here for he's here to be the third round quarterback or the third um sorry not third round the third quarterback um but i think he's kind of shown that that's okay and and I see him not comparison in their playing or throwing, but in the contact thing where, you know, when you tried to see Ben Roethlisberger slide, you're like, why the hell did you do that? You're bigger than he is. Go over him. You know what I mean? So you can kind of get that feeling from him. But um, I, I I would prefer to not have a taste of milk in the Seattle Seahawks. Thank you. Just Jeff, I, I'm dying to hear your thoughts. Your thoughts. I'm not quite there yet. Uh, when I saw him throw in the first game, that touchdown pass, I think it was the Landers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> probably the ugliest touchdown pass I've ever seen. <laughs> so I'm not quite ready to say he's a 53 man player yet, but I no. think he's a guy you can throw in the practice squad and you can just kind of see, can you develop? So they don't really have a great, like Geno Smith, when he was at quarterback, quarterback sneaks last year, he didn't look very good at that. And if they can use like a short yardage, they've had trouble in short yardage in this regime for years. So if that's something you can work on and develop, then go ahead. But I can't quite get that Tebow out of my head because the first game I was almost laughing watching because I didn't know much. I remember writing you all before the thing. I'm like, oh, these preseason games are going to be rough because they have no backup quarterback that's fun to watch. And both these games, he's been really fun. So been. I hope they can kind of find a role for him, develop him. But I'm just not that quite yet there yet. I need to see more. Okay. I, I think that makes that makes the most sense. It is, it is definitely crazy for me to be bringing it up, but I want you both to keep that in mind. I've now planted the seed. When you watch him in this last game, watch how he runs. Imagine him as somebody who is essentially an option quarterback in short yardage situations and goal line situations. Maybe he can be an H back and do like Taysom Hill. I've never seen him catch a ball, so I don't know what he's like that, that way. But... I think that having a player like that is valuable and is very rare. And I never, ever said this guy, like some other guy could be our Taysom Hill. I don't think that's a guy that usually exists. I think they're very, very rare. I think this guy might have that potential. I think I actually have more question about whether the coaches are creative enough to think that way, to be totally honest. But I am I'm intrigued, and I've if nothing else, I've enjoyed watching that guy play. I really hope he doesn't slide anymore. I just want him to run like a freight train over people. It's fun. That guy is just a big doofus. Like get him out there doing it more. So, uh, all right, let's close with talking about the Richard Sherman interview of Pete Carroll, of which I did not hear the full interview. I did hear the clip of him talking about the final play in the Super Bowl. So Dana, I think you have you both listened to that full interview? I'm not quite finished with it yet, but yeah, I've listened to a good chunk of it. Okay. I have. Tell me, tell me, you guys should probably lead this conversation a little mm -hmm. bit more than me. I, I would basically just focus on that Super Bowl realization because I think that that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. But what else? What else came out of that conversation? Well, let me let me just comment on that because I think that's what a lot of people saw. I will tell you that when that first popped up, just that clip popped up, I was like, oh, and I hit play because I wasn't sure. And I was so impressed with Pete Carroll and the way he talked to Richard Sherman. He just talked to him like they were friends instead of like being interviewed. He didn't have any of the shininess to his answers that you get in press day. And when he looked at Richard Sherman and he was like, this is why we had to do that play. And I stood behind it and you guys wouldn't hear that for years. And I respected that because he called him out. He was like, I explained this to you and you decided to not hear me. And I loved that. And that's how I knew instantly it was going to be a different kind of conversation. And, and Richard did not enjoy that moment. You could see it on his face, but at the same time, it was just, 
it was not, it wasn't, you know, a press interview. You could just kind of feel that connection between the two of them. And I loved it. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Jeff. Um, yeah. Well, number one thing for me was I made a lot, I've had a lot of arguments with people in the last 10 years about Daryl Bevel versus Pete Carroll who called the play. And for years, everyone's like Pete Carroll called the dumbest play in Super Bowl history. I don't think Pete Carroll's ever called an offensive play Mm -mm. and hearing the problem process of that when he referred to it as the play callers made the call that made me happy i've said that for years everyone's told me i'm a homer i'm biased so hearing pete break down that they just all pete said was we have to throw one of these next three plays i kind of was sure and pushed back a little bit and i've always thought they should have done play action there or rolled russell out but that's a whole other story but i, I thought pete handled it really really well um i'm surprised sherman didn't push back a little more on marshawn and but his answer was just really concise. It was clear. Mm-hmm. You could see how much it's obviously hurt both of them. But Dana's right. Like it's cr- kind of crazy how that relationship just come around and where it was, where Pete was just R- Sherman was just so critical of the organization and what mm-hmm. had happened to them and the whole Russell thing and how everything's just come. When it, you can just hear how much Sherman respects him, and maybe it's because of how things have changed in the last basically 14, 15 months around the team, but. It was, it was pretty cool hearing the whole thing. And they, they were going back. Pete kind of admitted. Sherman was telling the story about how bad like Pete wanted to beat New England the first time they played them in 2012. And Pete was surprised that it was so that the whole team could tell. And they said it was just a way out of character for you. And so there was, there was some pretty cool tidbits. They were talking a lot about like some of the things he learned coaching. And you can see how much Sherman respects him. Mm-hmm. And like they were telling some story. Even Sherman was telling stories to Pete that he didn't really know about like how him and Browner started talking and how Pete had lost track of Brown and Browner and John brought him in for a workout and he remembered him from college and said, we need to sign that guy. And there was all these kind of cool tidbits, but yeah, it was really fun. Listen, it wasn't hostile. Mm-hmm. Sherman was Mm-mm. there with him. It's because when Sherman was, well, it's more when you hear the KJ Wright podcast, just alternative to this, where you can just see how much that eats at those guys mm-hmm. and all the conspiracy theories and, it's, it was nice to kind of hear a clean and concise, not that, oh, we were trying to get Russell the MVP, one of those. or Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, I think I've learned over the years that there is no returning to that play that ends up in a positive. Like, there's just no, like, people, it is such a wound. And regardless of what priors you get confirmed or not confirmed, people just see red. They just, <laughs> They just see awfulness in there. And so it's, I get that and I want to acknowledge it. I also, the petty part of me is right where Jeff was. I said from the moment that happened and all the follow through, Pete Carroll didn't call that play. Mm-hmm. Pete Carroll is going to, he from his, the way he approaches leadership, he was also never going to let Daryl Bevel take a single bullet. He was going to mm-hmm. step in front of every arrow coming his way and take take that for him because that's the kind of leader he is and that's his philosophy and i have a ton of respect for that kind of approach to leadership and the fact that people used that and like didn't put two and two together and assumed oh no pete carroll did call that play that's just like lazy and i think off and a couple other things to this one Pete, you can like kind of mince words here but Pete Carroll did say, uh, yes, we have to run. We have to have a, at least one pass out of these mm-hmm. plays. That's basically a math equation. In order to get mm-hmm. the maximum, the four plays and the time available, they were going to probably have to pass at least once. Mm-hmm. And so that's not really a decision. That's just. It's math. not debatable. It's, it's, that's it's, just had it's, to happen. Yeah. If you want to criticize Pete Carroll, criticize the timeouts that got burned ahead of that series that forced them to have to potentially have a pass as one of those plays. That's a thing that I would absolutely criticize Pete Carroll about. I think you can criticize Daryl Bevel about the the play that he called and the time he, he called it, you know, if you want. But I think that the person that gets the least amount of criticism and people are going to think, oh, of course, Brian brings this up. But I absolutely think you have to, like, I started with Pete. I go to Daryl. Russ, Russ has to be part of this. Mm-hmm. Russ could have read something pre-snap. There is audio of him being interviewed. A softie sent this to me of him saying, yeah, I didn't see 
Malcolm Butler, like he didn't identify Malcolm Butler coming in on that play. He didn't see. He also threw that ball high. It's supposed to be, if you know, it's supposed to be thrown low. I think you can also give criticism to the, I think it was, was it Lockett that didn't make the block or was it Curse that didn't make no, it? No, Curse. Curse. Curse didn't make the block. Mm -hmm. so there's, there's definitely blame to go around. And I think that Pete did. It was just a did. bad play. I mean, that's, it happens. It just oh, happened at the wow. worst time ever. And, I think and Malcolm Butler Robert made the play of his life. You're right. Well, Ricardo Lockett on the field. The, <laughs> yeah. the part of the conversation that hurt the most for me was Pete saying, and you know, if we if that if we make that play, if we score there, we'd go back the next year. We would have had three in a row. And Sherm was like, absolutely. That's Which, how much this yeah. moment, it wasn't, it didn't even lose one Super Bowl. It probably lost multiple Super Bowls. Oh, yeah. But does that not absolutely infuriate you that the players got so into their own ego that that one play that was a great play by Butler was a crappy play. It was a crappy situation. They let that derail an entire team for years after that. That's on the players. That's on that defense. It, that is on all of those players who decided to sulk instead of fight. And that makes me so angry. It's a great point. Yeah. And that's just, that's just Pat Riley's whole philosophy is the disease of me. And that's how his whole thing, and you see it with sports all the time. They had Shaq and Kobe in LA and those two break up and a little thing like that. And they're never the same. And you right. see it all the Jerry Jones kicked Jimmy Johnson out of the building. Cause he was getting too much credit. Mm -hmm. They haven't been to the Super Bowl since then. Right. It's these little, it's, there's such a thing of ego in sports and that whole thing just yeah. kept down what should have been a dynasty and they lost trust in Pete and Pete could have handled it better. And the players never, they never could get over it and conspiracy theories, ego. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's funny though. though. I, 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 I really hear and uh, like generally, agree with a lot of the sentiment you're bringing mm -hmm. Dana. I also, man, do I relate and sympathize with players and the amount that they put their bodies on the line. I mean, you remember what, how many of the secondary was injured in the oh, Green Bay sure. game and then was playing through yeah. things that they actually needed oh, surgery yeah. for. And, you know, Cam had been injured the day before. Like they just put their mm -hmm. bodies on the line. And you think about, all the subplots that were going on relative to how certain players were treated versus others by the coaching staff. And, and you get to that pinnacle moment that you've not just been working that whole season for, but your whole life, mm -hmm. your whole life is like in the balance and like what your legacy is and what you're going to reflect on. And it would be, it takes the best of the best of the best of the best type of person to be able to compartmentalize that in a productive way and move on. I, I totally understand that. I really, really do. But the part that bothers me is that they let it fester. And instead of trying, even trying to keep it even keel, they just made it worse within themselves. And they yeah. just all the talk to each other and all the crap to each other. And they disliked Russell Wilson so much. They let that take over. And that, that really is bothersome to me because they lost focus of the goal. And I understand their body. And you're right. That defense was beat to hell. I mean, if you go watch the Green Bay game, it was Sherman. a mess, uh, right? Yeah. Oh, Sherman's arm. I don't know how he played at all. Earl's shoulder was messed mm -hmm. up. Yeah. It was a it was a complete disaster. So it was great they were even in that point because they were so beat up. But it just, when he made that comment and then Richard agreed, I was, I almost, I wanted to go through the screen. I'm like, I could shake you because this, they shouldn't, shouldn't have to be that, that way. Shouldn't have to be that way. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and John Schneider and Pete also reacted to it in weird ways by trading Max Unger for Jimmy Graham. And this idea that if we had had Jimmy Graham somehow Russ would have made that play, like really stupid thing. So anyway, this is yeah, not meant to bring all of that. There's a lot of folks here. Yeah. The, it's, yeah. it, I, I will, we will talk about this probably for the rest of our lives because mm -hmm. it's just, it is the play. It's probably the single most impactful play in the history of the NFL. Like that's just the reality. We, we got on the wrong side of it, and it had it, it, it had such a massive impact on the franchise. The only way to make that be less of a wound it will always be a wound is to get another one, and ideally to get another one with Pete as a coach. That would just be 
Yeah. That would be a, just an ideal. And I think it would allow a lot of us to just let that go. Yeah. It would help. It would and help. I think that's, that's the, the next step. Okay. Yeah, but- <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. We're gonna they, say they might have been in line for a Super Bowl if they drafted John Michael Schmitz in the second round this year. Oh, Jeff. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Me and Brian were having a rough Friday night. My God. I watched every one of that guy's snaps and I, he looks like a better center than Olu to me. I, so uh, you know, everyone's like, ah, uh, Olu's gonna be great. I don't know. Hopefully. I, I <laughs> It is amazing to me how much that position drives you insane. <laughs> you know what? It only is because of this team, because they have chosen to go the most ridiculous, idiotic route with that position. They've had so <laughs> many opportunities. I don't want to see another Patrick Lewis or, you know, another, you know, uh, uh, what was the last guy we had last year? Um, Austin Blythe. Austin Blythe. And they've just, they've gone bottom of the barrel in a lot of these cases and they could have a difference maker there and max unger people are like center position doesn't matter tell me that this line Mm. that that this line isn't massively different as soon as max unger left tell me that a a a pro bowl center does not just make both of your guards better does not make your whole line better because they make the better calls does not make your quarterback better people forget how much there used to be a split i would do of um, how Russell's stats were when Max Unger was healthy and played versus when Max Unger was out. Russell's gameplay dropped because he had to take over more of the line. Like, mm-hmm. it, I know what the analytics say. I know what the marketplace says in terms of, of, of contract value. I still, I believe what I believe. I believe that that position is more important than not spending any resources on it, which is, I think, what the Seahawks have continually done. I think Brown looks okay so far. Uh, yeah, I've liked him so far, but yeah. I think there's a when you're looking at possible ten year starter kind yeah. of they they just have totally different. So I, I did think Brown and the offensive line looked good last game. Michael mm-hmm. Bennett was kind of raving about how they were moving people off the ball, but to me, just having that ten year starter with those two tackles to me that just projects it's such a nice group. And now you're playing with fire again. You don't we're rolling the dice again. I yeah, I know I'm, I'm extending us further. I, the offensive line for me is another topic, and I am seeing the offensive line a little differently than I think most folks are. I do think Evan Brown's played fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have an emerging question mark at Charles Cross at left tackle. Um, I, I think his pass blocking, he he got beat like a drum multiple times in this game by backup, backup defensive linemen from the, the Cowboys. And I have been on record saying I think Charles Cross was a good but not great um, rookie at left tackle. And so I want to be wrong about that, but it is a question mark in my mind, his play at left tackle. And so offensive line is not a check mark for me yet. It is a question mark for me right now. But, but a little question mark, right? Not a big, it is, it is a little question mark. It is not, it is a, it is a yellow flag, not a red flag, but Fair it's enough. got my attention <laughs> because it's going to make a big difference on uh, like how that offense, all those toys that we have to play with, even without JSN are going to be highly reliant on how that offensive line plays. Oh, okay. So another year where the line of skirmish is a question mark. On both sides of the ball. You two this are is, killing me. This is the difference between, between, you know, Howie Roseman and John Schneider. It, it, like in a nutshell, mm, I think God. they're very similar. I think they're very similar GMs in most cases. But they're almost the inverse. Howie Roseman had a ton of problems actually finding skill players. His receivers and running backs were all crap for a long time. Um, where the Seahawks were getting DK Metcalf and people were like Philadelphia fans were just roasting Roseman about his picks. And but what Roseman always does is he prioritizes offensive line and defensive line. Mm-hmm. And Schneider has not done that well. <laughs> He's prioritized offensive linemen, but he hasn't gotten a lot of good ones. And his defensive line approach has not been to put a lot of resources into the interior line. So I don't know. I, I uh, It's going to be fascinating to see how this all plays out. Seahawks are pretty close. This next week we're going to see. We got the game coming up on Saturday. A lot of players won't play. Then they got the cut down. We're going to see some moves there. I think the Seahawks roster could look meaningfully different on the interior defensive line when we get to the regular season. So uh, – what I will say as we close up, um, 
we will do some uh, – I will try to do a roster prediction, at least on the blog. Um, we might not have time to do a show on that. Um, and those are kind of boring sometimes anyway. We will do our prediction show next week. So that is a long one. Uh, we will get those started, but – be We're ready. so bad at that, though. <laughs> I don't know, Dana. I, I think, look, Evan had them winning three games last year. Fair, so. but that's, you know, just fun. <laughs> I know. So so I'm looking to the, forward to the prediction show. And then we're on to the regular season, folks. So we're getting close. We're getting close. Uh, and it's been great talking to both of you tonight. I want to thank Dana O'Gorman, at Dana OG on Twitter. Jeff Simmons. I especially want to thank, at Real Jeff Simmons on Twitter, I especially want to thank Jeff's internet connection that wonderfully uh, crapped out as he was bragging about never having internet connection problems. That was a highlight for me tonight. <sighs> and uh, I am Brian Nemhauser at Hawk Blogger on Twitter. Give the show a like, click subscribe, go over to patreon.com slash Hawk Blogger, join up right now. Join the community. Season's getting going. Be a part of it. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. <laughs>